Okay, we are live everyone. Good afternoon, Nova fans and happy new year. My name is Gina Varamo. I'm the outreach manager at Nova and I'll be your host for this afternoon's virtual field trip exploring the blueprints of organisms. So 2020 is behind us and we're looking forward to a new year of scientific discoveries and technological breakthroughs in 2021. So this year, Nova is kicking off 2021 with a bang with Beyond the Elements. It's a three-part series that takes us on a journey to find the key molecules and chemical reactions that have paved the way for human civilization, life, and the universe as we know it. So today we're chatting with Dr. Monica Hall Porter from the University of Texas at Austin. And she's a key voice uh, in Nova Beyond the Elements life. Um, and we're gonna talk all about DNA and even extract some from some strawberries. So if you wanna follow along with the experiment at home, um, you'll need a couple household materials that are in the list um, in the description below. Um, and we'll have time for audience questions as well. So if you have any questions, please make sure to drop them in the Q&A or drop them in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can either throughout the broadcast or closer to the end. So um, without further ado, Monica, I'm gonna hand it off to you. What are we doing today? So um, first of all, before I get into what we're gonna do, I have to say thank you. I always think it's great to start from a place of gratitude. And today I'm thankful for a lot of things. One, um, I'm thankful that I am healthy. I'm thankful that my family is healthy. I'm thankful for being here. And I'm thankful that you all have chosen to join us today as we explore DNA. So we're gonna do a couple of things today. Um, first, we're gonna talk a little bit about DNA and I'm actually going to build a molecule uh, or a model um, of DNA um, uh, using some pretty fun things. I have some Twizzlers here, all right? And I also have some gumdrops, I have some different colors of gumdrops uh, and toothpicks. So we're gonna build a model first. Okay, and then the follow along portion, um, we're going to actually extract uh, DNA from strawberries. So I'm joining you uh, from my kitchen uh, here in Austin, Texas. And so one of the things that um, I thought was really neat about doing a session like this is showing that you can extract um, DNA from an organism, a strawberry plant, um, with just some common household items. But I think before we get started with, with that extraction, we have to ask ourselves and also the model making, what is DNA? All right, well, DNA is a big molecule, a larger molecule called a polymer that's made up of building blocks, okay, called monomers. Now, those are some very fancy um, uh, uh, science words, but basically to say that if you stacked the building blocks on top of one another, they would make a larger molecule, okay? So the DNA molecule um, basically, basically consists of three parts or several parts. Let me just say that, all right? There is a backbone, which is going to be represented by our red Twizzlers, okay? And then we have uh, nucleotides, which are, um, which are uh, a combination of a few things, but the main star is a nitrogen containing base. And there are four bases for DNA. Now, that makes up the language of DNA or the alphabet of DNA. And there are four letters, right, that we have to remember, okay? We have A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. And I hope everyone's able to see that. Now, the backbone of DNA is actually made up of repeating uh, units of sugar and phosphate, which is another, uh, which is another um, uh, component of that backbone, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of build a model of DNA because I think it's really important to kind of get your hands on this. Now, um, something that was on my little cheat sheet uh, that I wanted to show you is that DNA is a double helix, all right? You all have seen that twisted double helix. Well, this is what we're gonna make. All right, now, in order to get the two strands of DNA, there are a couple of things that we have to remember, all right? Adenine, okay, which is represented by the purple gumdrop, always has a partnership with or pairs with thymine, okay? So in our model, you're gonna see adenine and thymine together. All right, let's put these back. 
Then, guanine, represented by the green, always pairs with cytosine, represented by the orange, okay? Now, these bases pair up, all right? Such that a DNA strand, so if we start with making a DNA strand, here's our backbone, remember? Okay, if you have cytosine on one strand, double helix, so that means two strands, that cytosine is always gonna pair with guanine on the other strand, all right? And these pairs are held, these base pairs are held together, all right? So you can kind of see that the backbone kind of forms a scaffolding for them, all right? So I've got one that I started here. Okay. A, which is purple, pairs with T, which is yellow. Guanine, which is green, pairs with cytosine, which is orange. And you can check that base pairing all the way down this strand that I've made, all right? But what about that other backbone? Well, first let me back up. I got one more base to put here. So if I have thiamine, recall that thiamine is always going to pair with adenine. Let's make sure the toothpick doesn't break here. They're kind of delicate. And by the way, if you try to make a DNA model at home, um, especially for younger kids, um, parents use the flat toothpicks because they aren't as sticky, but they are a lot more um, delicate than the round toothpicks. I don't want anybody to poke their fingers and hurt themselves. Mm. So I'm gonna add this to my backbone. On one side, ah, okay. And then we just need the other side of that backbone. And then we can visualize what it means when we say double helix. All right, so I'm just attaching the other side of the backbone here. And my toothpicks are a little bit temperamental, so bear with me. Oh, we have a question while you're doing that from Janice. Yeah. She wants to know, what's the name for the backbone? Oh, well, it's literally called a sugar phosphate backbone. It's made of alternating units of sugar and phosphate. All right. I might have to just leave this one off because it's not going to work for me. And I'm going to grab a pair of scissors to cut the extra backbone off here so that it doesn't kind of get in the way of our model. Okay. But you can see here, I built this model of DNA and I'm simply going to twist it. And there you have your double helix of appropriately and correctly paired basis. Okay. Now, DNA is present in all living organisms, okay? And it literally provides a blueprint or instructions for everything that the cells of the organism does. And DNA is present in all of our cells, all right? So pretty cool. All right, so there's our DNA model. DNA model. The best part of this, and parents, I'm sorry, please don't be mad at me, but it's really fun to eat the candy after you're done. And I haven't had lunch yet, so <laughs> I need some substance. Okay. That's okay. So there's Quick that. Huh? Quick sugar burst. Yeah. A little burst of energy there. Okay. So now that we've made a model of DNA, we should get to extracting some DNA from our strawberries. Now, I got some strawberries here. All right. And strawberries make a great um, a fruit for uh, extracting DNA because they're, it's, uh, it's octopoid, so that means there are eight copies of the genetic material in each cell, okay? So you can, um, See, we'll see DNA at the end, but I think you mean, I think the questioner means that can you see, actually like see DNA with the naked eye. And unfortunately we're going, our DNA that we're going to extract, we'll be able to see it uh, at the end with our naked eye, but um, recall, re realize it's a lot of DNA that we're visualizing that's actually going to be um, kind of brought together by the solutions that we're, that we're using to extract it, okay? All right, so um, to extract DNA, we need a few things, all right? Um, we need, a resealable plastic bag, 
which I have here. And I like to use the thicker plastic bag just because sometimes we get a little overzealous in one of the steps uh, to extracting the DNA. We end up with holes in bags and strawberry juice everywhere. <laughs> All right. We're going to use two strawberries and I'm going to pull the green parts off of the strawberries. So just, you know, simply pull the green parts off and throw those over there. Okay. All right. So I got my bag oops, and my strawberries. All right. I'll put my strawberries in my bag. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the DNA extraction solution, all right? And I'm going to use a glass to do this. So there's my glass, all right? And I'm going to put in, get my measuring spoons here. By the way, um, I pulled out my set of measuring spoons when I was prepping for this and Gina said, um, we're not gonna use all those, are we? And I said, no, but one of the things I highlighted about um, the pandemic is this presented a great um, chance for my children to actually get some good lessons in mathematics and fractions because you can teach a lot of mathematical principles greater than, less than, equal to, uh, also fractions with the measuring spoons. So we've been having some fun with that, but we're only gonna use the, <clears throat> we're gonna use the teaspoon for this because we are going to put in two teaspoons of detergent. And this is just, just regular dish detergent. Okay. And then I'm going to use this same spoon. I'm gonna wipe it out real quick because the salt, I'm gonna measure the salt next and the salt would stick to it. So I'm going to put in one teaspoon of salt, a rule my mom taught me about preparing and cooking things is not to ever pour your salt over your container. So um, I'm going to pour it over the counter. So if I spill any, it doesn't end up in the extraction, um, in the DNA extraction buffer, giving me too much salt. So over the counter, and then I'm going to pour that into my glass. And then I'm going to add a half a cup of water. Okay. Now, what's so special about salt <clears throat> and dish detergent and water? Well, the dish detergent specifically has some properties that are similar to the properties of the walls, the cells that we're trying to break up. And that's that they have um, a, a component called lipids, right? And so literally we're going to break open the cells using a component that already exists in them, which is lipids. So I'm gonna stir that. I'm gonna try not to make too many bubbles, all right? I'm gonna stir that gently, make sure it's all mixed up. And then the salt um, optimizes uh, the DNA extraction capabilities of this mixture. Okay. Now, we can set that to the side. That's me. And we're gonna go back to our strawberries in the bag. Now, please be gentle, okay? Do not <laughs> go to town hammering on this bag. Word, be gentle. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but very gently start to break up or, or um, squeeze the strawberries because you want the strawberries broken up. And basically what that does is it increases the uh, area or it increases the likelihood that the lipids in the extraction buffer will have access to the lipids in the cell walls and strawberries. So you get more DNA extracted uh, if you can break up strawberries. Now you can also try this same DNA extraction protocol with other fruits. Bananas are cool, so are kiwis. And what I mentioned basically are two uh, different types of fruits that have multiple copies or more than um, two copies of the entire genome uh, in their cells. And it's also fun to do a little bit of comparison so you could extract from all three fruits and then compare to see what your yield of DNA is. All right, so once those are, once that's broken up pretty well, okay, then you're going to go back to your extraction buffer, all right? I want you to gently open your bag, okay? And I'm gonna put two 
teaspoons of this extraction buffer into my bag. Now, I'm gonna close it again and I'm gonna squeeze it, but please don't make a lot of bubbles, all right? Try not to make a lot of bubbles as you continue to mix and squeeze this. Okay. Remember now you wanna gently. Now, while you're, um, while you're gently mashing this a little bit more, you might have, if somebody is with you, like an adult helper, um, you might wanna have, take this opportunity to have them grab your ice cold rubbing alcohol from the fridge, from the fridge or freezer for you. Um, mine is in the freezer, so let me grab it really quickly. Let me grab mine too. Okay. All right, so you wanna minimize the bits, but you don't wanna make a lot of bubbles. Okay. And there will be some bubbles, but. Okay, now. The next main step of this protocol is going to be to filter out the larger bits of strawberry tissue from, uh, from this uh, cell extract. So you can do this but a number of different ways, all right? So I have a larger glass here. Um, you can use cheesecloth, which I have here. Just a little square cheesecloth placed in a funnel, okay? You can use a coffee filter as well. You have to be really careful though, because you don't want to tear the coffee filter when you um, put the, um, the, um, the cells, the lysed cells in there. So there's the funnel that also, I mean the um, coffee filter that also works in the funnel, all right? Or you can use a fine mesh strainer if you don't have any of those. Okay. Now, um, one thing I want to in introduce a technical term for you. Um, I told you that the detergent would help to break the cells open. That the technical term for that is you're going to lyse the cells. L Y S E. Lyse literally means to break. Okay. So basically, this was a cell lysis, lysis uh, a procedure that we performed. We broke the cells open. All right. So now, I've got my funnel. I've got my cheesecloth. All right, and I think this funnel is gonna to be too small for the opening of my glass. Hmm. So I'm gonna use a little baby food jar. Actually, that's the better thing to do. Get your small baby food jar. All right, and I'm gonna set my funnel there, All right? With my filtration piece there. I'm gonna open my bag and I'm just gonna pour this into funnel and cheesecloth. All right. Oh, Emmy, uh, someone is saying that Emmy says she goes to the University of Texas. Hi, Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> Hook them. All right, so what you'll see happening eventually is you'll see um, some of the, um, of the liquid dropping down, uh, filtering down into your glass uh, jar your glass, and you can gently take your cheesecloth or coffee filter, you're probably using cheesecloth, um, but you can gently squeeze the liquid or squeeze the cheesecloth so that you squeeze the liquid down into the, the container that you're using, all right? So- How much do you want? Um, you know, it, you don't really need a specific, a specific amount. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end we're gonna we're gonna um, add an equal amount of alcohol, but we're gonna eyeball it. So just as much as you can get out, basically. All right. And I had a little snafu here. My cheesecloth actually um, busted open in my funnel, so I'm gonna have to filter this a second time. Oops. You know, maybe I should have done one of those magic of TV things and had one already prepared. <laughs> if this is live, man. This is uh, this is science at its best. We experiment. Sometimes it fails, and that's okay. 
That is true. And that's one of the things I really had to, that I learned, uh, lessons I learned, learned along the way as I was a trainee in graduate school and undergraduate is that, you know, you do have times when things don't go um, exactly the way you planned them to or you wanted them to. But, you know, if it weren't meant to be iter an iterative process where you try something, you try it again, it will be called search, not research. Get it? <laughs> research. <laughs> I have corny jokes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I think I've gotten most of, let me get a little paper towel here, got a mess. I've gotten a good amount of out, but I still have a little chunk of my of strawberry in there. So I'm going to try to get that out. Give me a moment here. Bear with me. Because <laughs> we don't want, you know, you don't want big chunks of strawberry there. Yeah, I think that's so good. Yeah. So I got the big chunk out, I think. Let me see if there's another one in there. And I literally just use my uh, coffee stirrer to scoop it out. Okay. Um, Anya, Ayana from Facebook wants to know, is cheesecloth the best to use or does it really not matter? I'm using a fine mesh strainer and it's working yeah. really well. So. Yeah, I think the fine mesh strainer is probably the best to use because what you can do with the strainer, hold on, let me grab one. I have one right here actually in this, in this cabinet. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really great because it's really yeah. good at, at keeping all the uh, little particle bits out. Um, right. I can still push down on it a little bit and it won't yep. it won't go all the way through. And I've gotten a fair amount of, of liquid. Oh yeah. So I've got my fine mesh strainer here and I'm gonna just take what was what spilled out of my funnel and I'm gonna pour it into the strainer. And you can get a little bit more liquid out of there if you wanted to, just by using a spoon to press down on it a little bit, which is kind of what I'm doing here. Right. <laughs> for your finger, so, like I'm doing. For your finger, yeah, you can use your finger. <laughs> That, that does work, okay. So there it is. All right, now, ice cold alcohol. I'm gonna get a towel to wipe my hands because they're slippery because I've got extraction, um, uh, right. DNA extraction buffer on them and the remember it has soap, so it's slippery. And I don't wanna drop this by accident when I pour in the alcohol, it's glass. Okay. All right, so now I'm just grabbing my rubbing alcohol from my freezer. Yeah, nice and cold. Nice and cold, ice cold, all right? Now, um, someone from Facebook, Marsha from Facebook also is wondering, is it important that there are no chunks or are some chunks okay? Well, slight chunks are, are okay. Um, they're gonna settle to the bottom eventually, which is fine, um, but you just don't want huge chunks uh, near the top of the, of the, uh, of the liquid. Mm -hmm. All right, so here is my uh, cell lysate or extract, okay? Mm -hmm. And I am going to now look at the level. Um, if you're, it'll take your alcohol, I'll say a, a few hours to get really cold. Um, I cheated and threw mine in last night uh, when I came back home from the grocery store from picking it up. So I don't have a definitive answer to that question, but maybe an hour or so to get really cold. Um, and someone else wants to know, does it matter if you use ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol? Doesn't matter. Alcohol works. Right. In fact, if I were doing this, um, if I were doing this in, uh, with, my, with college students or in a, la a teaching laboratory, I would use ethanol. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, the, it has to be cold because basically it helps with, um, with, um, with, um, uh, uh, pulling the DNA out of the solution, okay? Mm. Because DNA is in here with all the other stuff. All right, so now I'm gonna tilt this to the side and I'm gonna slowly pour an approximately equal volume. Now, look, before we do this, you gotta make sure that you don't shake and disturb the layer, okay? Because what you're gonna see is that the DNA is actually gonna be at the interface or the place where the two layers of uh, alcohol and cell um, uh, lysate or cell extract meet. Okay, so very carefully, you don't, you want to layer this alcohol on top. So you don't want to like pour it in, you know, so you want to layer it on top. You see, I'm dripping, dripping alcohol down the side. <laughs> yep, and you'll start to see some stringy stuff at the, at the interface of the two liquids. Oh yeah. And that my friends is your DNA. Wow. Does my DNA look like that? 
Yes, your DNA would actually extract this way, the same way. Now with my college students, we do this from cheek cells. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we scrape our cheek cells and do the same lysis uh, protocol and alcohol and everything. So all that stringy stuff you see in there, can you see that very well, Gina? Oh yeah, look at mine too. Yeah, cool. Oh, That's yeah. your DNA. So cool. Now, there's another party trick. We can actually take this DNA out. So I got a coffee filter here. Oh, somebody asked if you could use other fruits. Yes, you can, but you might not get as much DNA because uh, strawberries actually have eight copies of the genome per cell, okay? Whereas other fruits don't have as many copies of the genome per cell. I think bananas have three. Um, kiwis, I don't remember how many are in kiwis, but I've also used kiwis to do this before. But strawberries, more bang for your buck, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just put this wooden skewer here. And I don't know if, I hope you all can see this, but if you do it, you'll start to see that the wooden um, skewer will attract some of the DNA and you can actually pull it up and that strand right there is extracted DNA. The strand that's attached to my wooden skewer or that's attached to your wooden skewer is actually DNA. That big you, old slob. Yeah, it's like a big old blob and if you swirl slowly, it looks very mucusy. You can actually get a pretty good amount onto your stick. Okay. And that's it. That's We've extracted DNA. DNA. So how come we can see DNA now? <laughs> Literally, because the chemicals that were a combination of a couple of things, the chemicals uh, that we used in, the, or the components of the extra extraction buffer made the cells burst wide open and they spilled their contents out into our solution that was just mashed up strawberry tissue, water, salt, and detergent, okay? And then the alcohol helped to pull the DNA out of the solution, mm. okay? And then what we just, what we have now is just the DNA that's sitting there, uh, at, that was sitting there at the layer. I think I've kind of disturbed it a little bit now. Actually, you can still kind of see some stringy bits. Let's see. Oh, yeah. That's on the side of the glass. Yeah, I'll pull that out for you guys. Yep. But the longer it sits, the more DNA will actually come to the surface and be uh, separated from the solution. Okay. I've got a great little like blob, like little DNA island in the middle. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, we have a couple questions in our Q&A. Okay. Um, someone would like to know, uh, so around how much DNA are we looking at right now? Ooh, you know, I don't know, but we could, you know, I don't know about how much we're looking at per strawberry because it, it really does, um, depend on the strawberry size. Um, so I can't answer that question definitively, but I know it's a lot. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And Nikki Woodworth wants to know, so we have this extracted DNA. Mm hmm so will it still be, is this still a double helix right now? Yes, it is. It is. It should, well, let me, let me just say, I will say that some of the structure will be retained and then possibly uh, there could be some structural interruptions or, or uh, uh, distortions uh, for, the, for the DNA, but much of the structural integrity should be uh, retained in the molecule. Um, I will say that this is not a pure DNA prep. It's very crude and it does still have um, a good amount of protein that's not normally associated with DNA um, associated with it. Um, but um, it, uh, the structural integrity of the, of the molecule is uh, somewhat retained. So yes, so the DNA, um, someone asked, would it go bad uh, eventually? Yeah, so eventually what will happen is this will, uh, the DNA will, will um, or as the, uh, ethanol uh, heats up, it could probably go back into the solution or fall out of, out of, uh, out of separation possibly. Um, so if you put it under microscope, what can you see? Well, you basically see what looks like a clump of mucus if you put this prep under a microscope, mm. okay? Um, it takes some really sophisticated microscopy to actually visualize uh, DNA, uh, far more complicated than what you would uh, find uh, available at like a laboratory um, in your local in your local school. 
Um, these are microscopes that are research grade and far beyond uh, the capability of a compound light microscope that you'd find. So someone wants to know, so the DNA from all the ruptured cells sticks together? Yes, it does, yes. Someone else would like to know, are histones still attached? Yeah, so those are some of the proteins that are normally um, that are normally associated with DNA. So bear with me here. Let's see, what do I have? Um, and I'm looking in my kitchen drawers to see if I can find something to make to explain this so that everybody can visualize what we got going on. And what I'm looking for is string. And unfortunately, ooh, I don't have any. Um, all right, so let's just do this. All right. So this yellow, well. I'm gonna use the yellow gumdrop because it's what I have with me. But this yellow gumdrop represents a core of protein called histones. Now, remember I said DNA was a really, really big molecule? Mm. It's so big that if it were not neatly organized, it would not fit on the inside of the cell. And so DNA is wrapped around what we call, proteins we call histones. And they are literally a set of organizing proteins for DNA. So if you can imagine if I took some of these yellow gumdrops, okay, four of them, okay. And I had a really, really long uh, piece of yarn or string and I elegantly wrapped that extremely long piece of string around equally around all this core of four of these like histone proteins. And when I say equally around, I don't mean wrapping them around them together, but I mean wrapping them around separately and connecting them such that each one is covered in string, that would be like a histone um, uh, arrangement that DNA is organized around, right? So yes, there's a lot of folding and specialized folding and packaging involving histone proteins uh, when you think about approaching DNA, looking at the DNA structure that's in the cell, yes. Cool. Um, so one would like to know, uh, will the strawberry taste the same without its DNA? <laughs> well, um, the taste of the strawberry is actually encoded by proteins that are uh, that are uh, that instructions uh, are carried for in the DNA. So the taste is all a part of the uh, the property of the of the genome that's accounted for or that is um, uh, that is carried in DNA. Cool. Yeah. And we have uh, one of our friends, Allison Green, has a lot of questions for you. So okay. the first one is, how does DNA mutate? Oh, okay. So a mutation is just a change in the DNA. And there can be a lot of different things that cause changes in DNA. Now, mutation sounds like a bad word to a lot of people, mm. but I think um, the genetic uh, basis of life is so cool um, because sometimes mutations aren't bad. Okay. There's a lot of redundancy in the genetic code and there's what we call wobble in the genetic code. All right. So when you wobble, let's say you're standing on a, on a ball, a ball, with a, a board around it and you can put your feet on it, but the ball is causing you to walk. You don't fall or mess up. You just move around a little bit, okay? And so sometimes mutations actually cause changes in the DNA, but don't actually ruin the DNA, all right? And so mutation is just a change in the base. So let me just model a mutation. All right, so the first base in our DNA model is adenine. Now, if this were, a, an organism that we know that first base was adenine and we changed it or it changed somehow to cytosine, okay? That would be a change or a mutation in the DNA, all right? Now, it's not always all bad because again, some, there's a redundancy in the genetic code so that some mutations don't have a detrimental effect on the organism. So what are things that can cause mutations uh, in DNA? Anybody ever go out into the sun without sunscreen? Oh, exposure, yes. yeah, oh yeah. So exposure <laughs> to UV light uh, can cause mutations in DNA. Um, and so that's why we make sure we wear our sunscreen because if those mutations in DNA are detrimental, it could lead to some effects that, that are undesirable. Uh, for health. Uh, and so that's why it's really important to wear your sunscreen. You want to protect your DNA. 
Mm. All right, we have, um, so Allison Green has a fifth grade classroom that's watching. So there's a couple other questions. Hi, fifth graders. Oh, they... I am so happy that you all have joined me. Oh, I, so let me just say this. I absolutely love uh, Miss Green. Um, I absolutely love uh, working with K through 12 students and I've done a fair amount of it uh, throughout the course of my career. And, you know, if there are any other educators here, I just want to thank you so much for persisting uh, and really um, caring for your students in spite of all that um, we've gone through with the pandemic. I really appreciate you and I appreciate your work. Yeah. Well, let's see, what do they got? We have um, some of her students would like to know, do strawberries have gender? Oh, do strawberries have gender? That's a good question. I am not sure about the, actually, so in the plant reproductive process, all right, there are parts of the plant that, um, that, are, um, that are, for lack of a better term, male and female, um, but the strawberries themselves, I have not um, ever thought about or, or read anything about gender of strawberries. So that is a good question. I do know that there are male and female parts of the plant that allow for the reproduction of the plant, but not, I don't know about the strawberry itself having a gender. So that's something I haven't ever read about before. Yeah. Um, they also have a question of why is it, uh, why do you not want bubbles in the solution when you're extracting okay. DNA? So I don't want bubbles in the solution because I want to make sure that um, the, so sometimes the extra bubbles can literally, um, can literally disrupt or provide um, or, or not allow you to get as much um, uh, uh, lysate out. So just to minimize the bubbles so that when you pour out everything, you aren't pouring bubbles and having to squeeze through bubbles and also squeeze through food chunks. Okay, so looks, sorry, but looks what, look what has happened as we said, let this sit a lot more. Wow, at the yeah. Yep. A little like DNA hurricane. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, we also have someone that would like to know, um, are you a geneticist and what's your area of study? Okay, so I am not a geneticist. Um, so uh, my uh, PhD is in molecular and cellular pathobiology. And so pathobiology is kind of a weird word, um, but the, um, the um, program literally looked at the molecular and cellular basis of disease processes, which is, and so that was in the uh, Department of Pathology. Um, and so um, I went to Wake Forest University uh, for my doctorate, go Deeks. Uh, and so um, the program was housed out of a pathology department. And so literally they wanted to get pathology in there. Uh, and so I studied cardiovascular disease as a graduate student, uh, looking at the effects of um, the female sex steroid hormone estrogen on the beginning stages of cardiovascular disease. And then as a postdoc, I continued along uh, with studying cardiovascular disease and estrogen, but looking at the effects of estrogen on uh, specific cellular responses in heart failure. Awesome. Um, we have a bunch of, oh, let's, let's follow up on that. Okay. Um, we would like to know, um, how'd you get interested in science? Did you take a fun class in high school? I'm wondering if this is from a high school teacher. <laughs> so actually, um, you know, it's interesting that, that you asked that because I think this illustrates a, a, a really good point. I didn't take one interesting class. I had a, um, a collection of interesting classes. Uh, the first uh, started in eighth grade. I never will forget uh, my science teacher. His name was Danny Dobbs. He was also my uh, track coach. And we had to dissect a fetal pig in class uh, one day. And then he came back the next day and gave us a pop quiz on the, stru the structures uh, in the pig. And I remember I made an 86 on that, on that pop quiz. And I was really happy because no one was expecting it. It was a pop quiz and that 86 was the highest grade in the class. And he looked me in my face and he said, Monica Hall, because my maiden name is Hall. He said, Monica Hall, you can do better than that. And I expect better than that from you. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, someone believes in me. And then um, I was exposed to a program um, at Jarvis Christian College, which is a historically black college in Hawkins, Texas, uh, where there was a woman who was in charge of the program. Um, her name was Bertha Brown, and she was the director of the Upward Bound program there. Now, while I was not an Upward Bound student, I had the opportunity to go to a lot of Upward Bound uh, events. And so um, Bertha Brown had a sister who was the Dean of the School of Science at Hampton University, where I went to undergrad and other HBCU, and her name was Dr. Johnny Jones. 
Well, Ms. Bertha connected me with Dr. Jones and an opportunity to do a summer program called NASA Sharp Plus. And as a sophomore in high school, I actually went to Roche Molecular Systems for an internship. So I'm from Texas originally, Hawkins, Texas, small, tiny town, but went to this internship as a sophomore at Roche Molecular Systems through the NASA Sharp Plus program. And so that series of events, eighth grade, high school or freshman in high school, sophomore in high school, that sequence of events really did kick off my interest uh, in, in science. Awesome. Um, we've got a bunch of fifth graders from Chicago that have some questions. Hello, fifth graders in Chicago. How are you? I hope you're having a wonderful day. <laughs> they would like to know, since the detergent breaks down the strawberry, what if you used a banana? Is it different materials that will break it down the same way? No, it's the same thing. So let me see. I'm gonna draw, see if I can draw something for you. All right, so bear with me. All right, so Okay, so this is a very simple drawing of a lipid molecule. It has two major parts. It has a head and it has a tail, okay? Soap is full of lipids, okay? Now, the cells of the strawberry, their cell walls have lipids. Okay, and this is very crude, so I'm sorry. The cell wall of the strawberry has lipids. Can you all see this? Yeah. It's called a phospholipid bilayer. And so there are heads and tails that are arranged. So the head uh, is facing the outside environment that has water and the inside environment that has water, okay? These are arranged like this because the tails are what we call hydrophobic, phobia. They don't like water, but the heads are hydrophilic. They like water. And so the reason why the soap is able to break open the cell membranes and anything that lyses cells has some detergent in it, okay? Is because these molecules like this that are in the soap, they're able to integrate with this lipid bilayer that we have here and actually break it open. Mm. Okay, so anytime we talk about a cell lysis buffer or breaking cells open, there's always some sort of detergent which contains the lipid molecules that are going to help to break that cell uh, open. So it'd be the same thing if you use bananas. It'd be the same thing if you use your, use your cheek cells, a piece of tissue from uh, any other specimen. Same thing. Break those cells open. That leads us to a, a very similar question from Juliana Ford wants to know, can I extract DNA from my cat? Well, <laughs> probably so, but I would not advise trying to do that. I would like this. You wouldn't get as much DNA from, from a piece of tissue from your cat um, that you did in your, uh, that you did in your strawberry. Because remember, strawberries have a lot of copies of the genome per cell. Mm -hmm. Please don't take DNA from the cat. <laughs> <laughs> they can try your own DNA. Let's, let's leave Kitty alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have another um, fifth grade and fifth grader from Chicago that would like to know, can you take DNA from two different fruits and mix them together? So, oh, that's a good, so you mean like taking like this crude prep of DNA or taking two types of DNA and putting them together and making a new fruit? Let's, let's go with option number two, because this could kind of is very similar to another question that came up is what happens if two DNA cells fuse, do they cause mutations? Okay, no, so the DNAs, the DNAs would not fuse, but what you can get, you can get fruits, uh, plants, animals that are hybrids. And so that means if a plant, that means the pollen from one plant is actually used to fertilize another plant, which would, could result in uh, the production of a whole new uh, type of fruit. And there are lots of fruits that are hybrids. Uh, that are specifically um, uh, produced in vegetables too, that are specifically produced uh, through laboratory manipulations to make a resultant uh, fruit. I believe um, there are a lot of apple, there are some apples, newer mm -hmm. apple varieties that take bits and pieces of the best parts of, of, um, 
of, of apple. Um, I can't, or the best species of apples to make new ones. And I can't remember the names of some of those types of apples that are bred uh, specifically for, you know, the amount of tartness that they have or the amount of sweetness, the snap of the actual apple flesh. Uh, so yes, you can make hybrids, um, but it wouldn't necessarily be considered a mutation. It's just genetically manipulated to produce something new or different. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple, a couple of questions about folks interested in doing this with the cheek swab. Mm -hmm. And they want to know, so this is being done on a plant cell. So there's mm -hmm. a cell wall. When you're doing it on an animal cell, does the lack of cell wall affect how the process is carried out? And could you talk a little bit more about using your cheek? Yeah. So literally you just have a cell, you have a cell membrane, uh, which is a little, which is, you know, let, which is uh, different from a cell wall. But again, same thing has lipids. The extraction buffer will break open that cell wall or lyse the cells. Uh, and it's a very similar thing with using the ethanol to separate uh, the, uh, the, the cheat cell or the cheat cell DNA from the solution. Now, if you're doing this with cheat cells, literally uh, the protocol is to, um, you can, um, scrape the inside of your cheek with a toothpick very lightly and then swish around uh, a little bit of Gatorade mm. uh, in your mouth. Yeah, Gatorade. Gatorade. <laughs> because it has the salts in it. Uh, oh. Yeah, 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 it has some salts in it. So you can swish around uh, Gatorade uh, and then uh, uh, put that into a cup and extract your, your uh, DNA from, from the Gatorade. So uh, there is a specific protocol uh, for that. Um, Gina, do you, if you have, um, if there are any classes that are interested in that, I, I, I do have, I think I have a protocol pretty handy. Um, for that, that would be great think. that we could. Okay. Um, so for everyone that's watching, we're gonna send you a follow-up email that will you know, have, a, we'll put a link to this protocol for the strawberries and maybe we can put a link to that in there as well. If folks want okay, to yeah. I'll send you that after the webinar is over. Yeah, I think that would be really great. Um, so we're running low on time. So I'm gonna oh. answer a couple last questions. Um, mm -hmm. we see a lot of thank you from folks in New Jersey, from folks in Michigan. Um, we, uh, we do have a couple of folks that still wanna know, um, there's a seventh grade, a seventh grade classroom in Michigan. Um, would like to know, uh, why does the alcohol have to be cold instead of hot? Okay, so the alcohol, the cold alcohol just aids in the, the ability of the DNA to be pulled uh, from solution. So the colder, the better. That's the, that's the short version since we're running low on time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know what, that's okay. There's just so much, there are so many questions and thank you everyone for being so engaged and being really patient as we sort through all of these questions. Um, someone else would like to know, um, Jamie Dang, are all genetic engineered foods bad? How should we critically think about this problem and what's the purpose of this technique? Yeah, so I think we should really think critically about um, the, the, the genetically modified foods and how uh, organisms and how they factor into our food sources. So genetic modifications can be used to make a number of things possible. Uh, drought resistant uh, 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 plant uh, speed, uh, plant variants can be made. Um, uh, 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 plants and foods that are engineered to be uh, resistant to pests uh, and other things that could destroy crops, right? And so if something is genetically modified, that doesn't mean that it's a bad modification. It just means that it was modified. So I'll give you one, one quick story on that. Um, genetically modified corn, is very common. And there are a number of genetic modifications that have been made to the corn plant to make it hardier in certain climates uh, and resistant to pests and drought resistant and a number of other factors. There is a project that one of my students has done in the past where they actually looked for the presence of genetic modifications uh, in corn chips, in corn by using corn chips. And they found that several types of corn chips did have genetically modified uh, strains of corn in them. Now, was that a bad thing? No, it just meant that the farmers who grew the corn that went into the chips decided to use a variant of corn that was modified to make it more hardy 
uh, mm -hmm. for their growing purposes. And so we should approach with, um, with a knowledge that a genetic modification just means a change in the genome. And actually, if you think about it, the corn or any other product that could be genetically modified, especially if it's a species that's been around for a long time, the corn that like corn, the corn that we eat today is nothing like the original corn. Um, and so genetic modifications happen along the way for a variety of, of, of reasons and a variety of types of plants. Broccoli really? is one of those plants. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's broccoli, is it broccoli? Yeah, I believe it's broccoli um, that originally started out as mustard grass. Interesting. And we've been able to, to, um, to uh, breed broccoli. That's the starting, the starting uh, plant. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, because of time, we're going to have to wrap it up here today. Um, Monica, if folks want to stay in touch or if they're interested mm -hmm. in more cool at home experiments or mm -hmm. learning about DNA, what are, do you have any, any places where you can point people to? Oh my gosh. Well, let me just say that in communities all across the country, there are nonprofit organizations and groups that are doing amazing work with students uh, with regard to all areas of science. Um, and most of them are virtual now because of the pandemic. And so they really have expanded their capacity to serve uh, student populations. So um, the other thing I would, uh, I would say on that is there are a few that I know of. One that's very near and dear to my heart is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's called Science Club for Girls. Uh, Science Club for Girls specifically focuses on providing a warm uh, and enriching environment for science, for girls to learn more about science. Uh, they do everything from life sciences to physical sciences, and it is a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. Um, then there's also um, STEM NOLA, which is headed up by Dr. Calvin Mackey. That's based in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Dr. Mackey is an, an engineer uh, by training, but he has all sorts of um, experiences uh, for, for youngsters, uh, uh, specifically uh, focusing on the K through 12 space. And he's, his program is on virtual. And then in Cincinnati, Ohio, Dr. Whitney Gaskins uh, is, I believe, an assistant dean at the University of Cincinnati, but then also um, has a nonprofit organization called the Gaskins, Gaskins Foundation that hosts um, uh, Cincinnati Stimulates, which is another K through 12 uh, science-based enrichment program. And so if, you, um, if you're looking for these uh, types of, of programs, you can literally you know, Google science enrichment um, uh, organization in your state and see what you, you come up with, uh, but they're all over they're all over. And um, many of them are doing this um, for free for students, which is I think really important to provide access to science enrichment for, for students. Awesome, yeah, absolutely. I see some folks um, asking if we can put links to these programs in the follow-up mm -hmm. email. Absolutely, yes, yep. we can have links to all these organizations as well as um, links to the two protocols that we talked about today. So, you know, I, I thank you so much for all of the overwhelming support from, you know, we had folks from Alaska, we had folks from St. Croix, New Jersey, Colorado, Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been super fun. New Hampshire, people are still popping in. Um, wow. Thank you for being so engaged and so involved. And just as a reminder, this is only the first of our series of three virtual field trips, all about Beyond the Elements, which are trying to have them be a little more interactive. Our next one will be in in February, so keep an eye out for it. We're going to be learning about the science of glass and glass blowing with the Corning Museum of Glass, um, and they're going to be doing some uh, live demonstrations of how their professionals blow glass and um, some experiments that aren't suitable for home but are pretty cool to watch from <laughs> far away. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for your questions. Um, for more chemistry content and to learn more about Beyond the Elements, be sure to tune in uh, to your local PBS station next week, Wednesday, February 3rd at 9, 8 central on PBS or on the PBS app. Uh, you get a special treat. We're actually releasing all three episodes on that first day, February 3rd. So you can binge watch all three episodes if you'd like. Um, so you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter for more updates at Nova Education to learn more about what we're doing with Beyond the Elements. We also have a new interactive launching where if you want to dig a little bit deeper in to some of the um, reactions that are happening and build some molecules. Uh, it'll be a really fun, free interactive as well. Um, and we'll be back in February 
So Monica, again, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being yeah. here. To yeah. all of our students and educators, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Um, and we'll catch you next time. Okay, everybody, take care. Remember, science is fun and it literally is for everyone. So enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, Monica.